Hey friends, welcome to Stonehouse. I'm so glad you could join me today. Uh, we are um, on vacation as a family and so I actually pre-recorded this so that you and we can still worship together even though we're not um, having church in person together. You see as a church plant um, we're a little, uh, you could say, short-staffed and um, so it's important for us to build in these times as a family where we can be away. So for the next two weeks actually uh, we will be online only this week and next week and then we will be back together on the 29th uh, to worship in person and then from then on as well. So so anyway, thank you for joining us, and uh, we have a special um, a guest preacher this morning. Um, Dr. David Johnson has joined us before, and he is um, going to join us again this morning, uh, and we are grateful for his time and effort and his words that he will share with us, um, God's words, and then the story of another saint, um, someone else that we... Um, stand with as we walk through this life and faith together. So to start us off this morning, uh, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 19. This is our call to worship. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, um, whose voice is not heard. Hmm. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun in the heavens which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Hmm, we've just seen the Olympics. Uh, we can kind of imagine that, especially if you watched the marathon. Um, and its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The psalmist goes on to say, the law of Yahweh is perfect reviving the soul. That's something that I need. I wonder about you. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, Enduring forever, the rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. And I'm going to skip to the end here. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Johnson, and I will join you again at the end. I want to thank you for tuning in to this, uh, this um, sermon. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, being with you uh, in person as much as possible, but uh, at right now, it looks like we'll be uh, be doing this by video recording. Uh, I'd like you, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to open it to Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, you might pause for a second and grab one and open it to Ephesians chapter 3, um, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, beginning in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 14 through 21. And please follow along as I read. Paul writes this, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it speaks to our hearts. And our prayer now is that you would do just that. By your spirit, you would take this word of yours and you would embed it within us. Make it memorable and helpful and, uh, and something that will change our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So my um, saint that I am uh, talking about today is uh, not a named saint per se. We don't call him Saint Carl, but uh, that's who he is, Saint Carl Barth. Um, he is probably the most influential churchman and theologian of the 20th century. Um, I should say was. Uh, I, I would put him on par with somebody like Billy Graham in terms of influence. Um, so just think of it, think of him in those terms. You, you maybe don't know much about him, but, uh, but you can believe me that he has had a tremendous impact on the life of the church. Uh, Karl Barth uh, was born into the home of Fritz Barth. Fritz was a pastor and also a theology teacher. Um, Fritz Barth wanted his son, as he grew up, he wanted his son to become a, uh, a pastor, and, and, and Karl um, pursued that. Uh, and he wanted him to become a positive pastor, and, and you might call it an evangelical pastor. Um, but Carl decided that he wanted to study with some of the great theologians of that day. And so he left Switzerland and went off to, uh, to Germany to study with Adolf von Harnack and, and uh, William Hermann and others in those, uh, in those German schools, those German liberal schools. And, and Bart um, was, was given a liberal theological education. Uh, liberal in the, in the technical sense of the word. Um, as he studied, uh, he imbibed the, this liberal theology, and then he became a pastor, and he began, began to preach in Soffenville in northern, northern uh, Switzerland. And as he preached, he, um, he, he became more and more convicted of the, the centrality of Scripture, in, uh, in, in the life of the church. He also preached to, uh, in a prison. Uh, you might say it was a captive audience. Um, and he preached there regularly. In fact, there's a whole book of sermons uh, of his that he preached to these prisoners uh, in, a, in a prison in Switzerland. And so, and so he began to preach, and it was out of his preaching that his theology was formed. And in 1914, uh, he was chagrined that, uh, that his theology teachers, Adolf von Harnack, William Hermann, and others, uh, had signed a statement in support of the, of the war effort of Germany in, for World War I. And, uh, and Bart just couldn't stomach that. He thought there was something wrong. And, and he, he began to study scripture more carefully. And, and ultimately, he wrote a commentary. While he was a pastor, he wrote a commentary on the book of Romans. Uh, it was published in 1919, and one uh, one later theologian said that commentary fell like a bomb on the playground of the theologians. Um, it just blew everything up, uh, and and you can I've read I've read it, and and it it it's not <laughs> it's not that great a commentary, but the preface is the uh, is is the key. It's really a, a fantastic preface that he wrote in in introducing. The commentary, and so that is uh, that's uh, Karl Barth's life. In, in as a result of the commentary, he was asked to come to uh, uh, Göttingen in Germany to to uh, be a, a theology teacher, and uh, so he, he taught there, and he taught in a couple other uh, German theology schools, and and ended up um, in nineteen uh, about nineteen thirty four. He uh, he signed a uh, he refused to sign a statement in oath to Hitler, 
uh, as as the as the Nazis were rising to power in Germany, um, Bart said no. He refused to sign this oath, and in 1935 he was uh, exiled from Germany, and he went back to Switzerland to Basel, the very town where where he was born, and became a theology professor there. And he was a theology professor there until he retired from 1935 on. Um, or 1936, I guess, on. In 1935, he, uh, he wrote, a, wrote what's called the Barman Confession, um, which is a, 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 a document that the churches were, sign, were signing to uh, say that, no, Hitler was not God, essentially. And, uh, and all of this led his, to his, uh, his exile um, and then his teaching at Basel. Uh, while he was at Basel, he uh, wrote, um, he continued to preach, but, but he wrote uh, his systematic theology, his, what he calls his dogmatics, the church dogmatics. Um, and and it, it's about, uh, well, I can't show you, it's about two feet long. You see all these books around me here. Um, this was about uh, two feet long. I don't have any room for it in my library, nor do I have the money to buy it. But uh, but nonetheless, it it, it it is the summary of Bart's theology, and he never finished it. It was supposed to be uh, five volumes. It turns out to be four volumes, but each volume is divided into parts, so actually there are 12 books that make up these four volumes um, of his theology. Uh, when, when he, after he retired, um, he was still working on this theology, but after he retired, he came to North America, to the United States, to do a tour. And he preached or, and spoke in uh, Union Theological Seminary and Princeton Theological Seminary, Chicago Theological Seminary, San Francisco Theological Seminary. So he made his way across the, across the uh, country and ended up at the Grand Canyon and other places to see this wonderful land. Um, while he was in Chicago, he gave this... Um, this message, or, or the, he, 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 he gave his lectures, and a student um, at the end asked him a question, asked him to summarize his theology. And, uh, and Karl Barth said, uh, well, I, I can summarize my theology in a, in a little song that I learned um, from my mother when I was just a little boy. And, and that song is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that is a summary of Bart's theology his own, in his own words. Um, and it is a profound statement. Uh, that I, I don't. I, I know we sing it to our children, and I strongly encourage you to teach your children this song, and 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 help them to understand it, um, because it is so profound, and it is such a marvelous summary of Bart's theology. Karl Bart would not appreciate um, this message because it's been mostly about him. Uh, and he doesn't think that that's how preaching should be. Preaching should be about the scriptures. And he wrote a little book um, back in, uh, well, somebody put together two sermons of Karl Barth. I'll, I'll hold it up to the camera a little bit here, and you can see uh, what he looks like. And he wrote this, he, he wrote these two sermons, one in 1912, and on the, uh, after the Titanic was uh, the Titanic disaster, after the Titanic sunk, um, and he wrote it, and the, and the focus of that sermon was the Titanic, and he found some passages of Scripture that supported his ideas, but they were his own ideas about the Titanic and the sinking of the Titanic and how that relates, um, how God relates to that kind of thing. Uh, the other sermon was preached in the 1930s, the early 1930s, and it was on the eve of Hitler. Um, beginning to take over Europe, and and it was on um, Mark chapter fourteen, the story of of the Jesus walking on the water, and then uh, then summoning Peter to come and walk on the water as well. And and the and the difference is, and it's a profound difference, and it's one that has struck me and a actually has influenced my theology of preaching, and that is the in the second sermon, it's all about the scriptures. 
and and he gives some hints as to as to what the church is going through um, in the light of Hitler's rise and 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 this uh, you know what Hitler was trying to do, but uh, but in the end, it's about the scripture and about um, how Christ didn't sink when when Peter was sinking. Uh, even though Peter failed, spiritual failure is not something that, that causes us to be rejected by Christ because Jesus reached out his hand and took Peter and lifted him up and got him back in the boat. Um, and, and, and he Bart says, this is somewhat of what the church is going through and, and, and we're going to struggle, um, but Jesus is always there. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And there's probably no better summary in Scripture of this theme than in Paul's prayer uh, in the middle of the book of Ephesians. He says this, I pray, and then he prays for two things. Uh, First in verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Um, That would be a a, a tremendous summary of of, of a large part of Bart's theology is that our, our salvation, our relationship with Christ is totally dependent on the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so Paul is praying that, uh, that we would be strengthened with the power of the Spirit to, to have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. Um, the theme of faith is huge in Bart. Uh, the theme of prayer is huge in Bart because he said uh, we, cannot, um, we cannot do the work of, of preaching the gospel, um, of, of restating the gospel, of learning about Christ. We cannot do that work on our own. We are absolutely dependent, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is a demonstration of our absolute dependence upon God. And so Paul prays that they would be strengthened in their inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says in the middle of verse 17, a second prayer. And the NIV has, and I pray that, but actually actually that, those, that word is not there. This is the second part of the single petition that Paul is making, a single prayer that Paul is making, that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. The central theme of Bart's theology is Jesus. This is what Jesus does. And it's particularly about Jesus' love for us. This Christ event where Jesus came to earth as God himself gave up his, his, uh, his standing with God, gave that up, took on human flesh, came to earth to, to die for our sins because he loved us. And Paul is saying, I'm praying that, that you would come to know, come to grasp the very depth and height and, 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 and width and breadth of, of Christ's love for you. Uh, this is how um, I prayed for our children, uh, the, our, our three girls. This is how I prayed for them when they were young, that they would come to know how much Jesus loves them. Often we pray that they would come to love Jesus, our, our children would come to love Jesus, and that, that's good, and that's, that's a good prayer, but it's far more important that they would come to know how much he loves them. That's the important thing. And, and, and that's what Paul is praying here, that, they, that these people, these Ephesians, and he's praying for us as well, that we would come to know how much Christ loves us. And that's a main theme of Bart's theology. And then he says, 
in verse uh, 19, and to know the love that surpasses knowledge. Do you see the, 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 the paradox there? Here is a love that you can't know, that surpasses knowledge, that goes beyond knowledge. And yet Bar Paul is praying that we would come to understand that which we cannot understand. In other words, the only way that it can come to us is through revelation. It's through God revealing himself to us. Um, that's our prayer. That's how we, how we, how we, uh, how we pray, that, that we would come to understand, to grasp the unknowableness, to grasp that which is unknowable. Maybe I should say it that way. <clears throat> to grasp that which is unknowable. In other words, we cannot know Christ's love for us unless God makes us know that. And the way that he makes us know that is through the Bible. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Um, Bart would say that's the only way that we can know the love of Christ is, is through the revelation that God has given to us. And then Paul concludes by saying, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And that too is a theme of, of Bart's theology, that God, God can do more. In fact, he wrote these, these, uh, these, these volumes, and, and one of the themes of his writing is that there's always more to know. There's always more to learn about God, because God is infinite. He goes beyond anything that we can think or imagine. Um, and now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, there it is again, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church. And that too is one of Bart's themes, is, is, is God's glory in the church. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> one of Bart's... Uh, followers, one of his disciples was Tom Torrance, T.F. Torrance. And, uh, and as, as he, he became a, a, a great theologian, a Scottish theologian, um, who, uh, who, who wrote some really important and, and, and great books. Um, but one of the books he wrote was, was a little book called Preaching Christ Today. And I was given that book to review um, and I wrote a review of that book for a journal, and and uh, and believe it or not, I got a letter from Tom Torrance thanking me for the review, and for the fact that I really understood what he was trying to say in that book. Um, in, in that book, Tom Torrance uh, talks about um, Christ, the preaching Christ today, and he talks about the love of Christ. Um, and and he uses an illustration his own his own experience as a uh, as a first of all as a as a military chaplain and then as a pastor and he, he was a military chaplain in, in World War II and he, and he was in Italy um, ministering to the British um, British Army and he, ra he he was out in the field um, and under fire and he comes to this young man who obviously is dying. Um, Torrance says he's only got about a half an hour left to live. It's pretty obvious that he's going to, going to pass. And, uh, and the young man says to him, uh, as, as Torrance was reading scripture, which Scottish pastors were doing or were supposed to do in those situations, he read scripture to him, um, read the story of Jesus, and, and, uh, and the young soldier said, uh, Padre, is... Is God like Jesus? Is God like Jesus? And of course, Tom Torrance said, yes, God is like Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of God. And then, then he says uh, a little while later, he was back home in Scotland and he was pastoring a church. This was before he became a, a great theolo theology teacher. He was pra pastoring a church and a, a dying woman he visited one of the women in his congregation, and she was dying, and, and she said the exact same question. Pastor, is God like Jesus? And Tom Torrance said, yes, God is like Jesus. What is God like? 
And Bart would say, if you want to see what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Lord, we pray that you would take your word um, and teach us how much Jesus loves us. Even in the midst of our struggles and our, our, our failures and our difficulties, we pray that we might learn how much Jesus loves us through the scriptures, through the Bible. Take your word, speak to our hearts for your glory, and in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Friends, let's sing those words, that truth, together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. But he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You know, I have been missing um, studying the Bible and, you know, it's been a hard month for me and I wonder if um, that's part of it. As I've been researching these lives of the saints, um, I haven't been studying uh, the same way that I, that I normally do. And there is something about this book um, that gives life and Bart knew that, um, Dr. Johnson knows that, I know that. Uh, I am looking forward to our next series uh, when we will be back in the scriptures. Um, because preaching is, um, it should be about the scriptures. There is value in what we are doing as we are getting to know some of these saints, uh, our fellow saints. Uh, we are gaining uh, an idea, a picture of what the church is. It's more than just our tiny church, obviously, but more than just the church that exists in the world at this moment. Um, we are part of a church that has been um, worshiping God and coming to the table together and coming to scripture and studying scripture together for many, many generations, for thousands of years. We are part of a long tradition, uh, and it's a gift to get to know some of our fellow saints. However, um, we find our footing in the scriptures. That is where we come to know who God is. God reveals God's self in this book. Friends, as you go from here today, uh, may you be drawn to read and find God um, in the scriptures. I'm going to close with um, a text that you've already heard, uh, and this is your blessing as you go on your way today. May you uh, be strengthened through God's spirit in power in your inner being, uh, with power in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded or established in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth and length and height and depth of that love. May you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly 
than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.